Nicole, I've got a brand new climate change strategy, and it's got your name written all over it. All right, Raleigh, what's going on? You know plankton that live in the ocean? Yes. Well, if we feed them enough iron particles, they will grow really big, suck all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and we'll have solved climate change once and for all. Oh, wow. Um, just to double check, the ocean isn't like a complicated and carefully balanced ecosystem where changing one thing actually ends up changing a lot of other things too, right? Mm. I'm pretty sure it's just A to B. So, Raleigh, after I did our whole episode about solar geoengineering, I had a bunch of extra research, and there's a there's a whole other kind of geoengineering that I want to talk about. You can't waste research. If you got it, we got to just, like, dole it out slowly. Exactly. So lay it on me. Exactly. Spread it out all over me. Um, specifically, what is fun to me about this research is this one guy... I'm going to show you this clip. I'm not going to give you a lot of context for it, but this is a guy who's really gone all in on this other kind of geoengineering. Sounds like my kind of guy. Buy Mother Nature one cheap cocktail a month, and you've taken care of her. Tonight on The Fifth Estate, he's been called a geo-vigilante, an eco-terrorist, a visionary who simply wants to save the world. It's almost like putting a teaspoon of our uh, multivitamin iron mineral that's all the ocean needs to come back to health. For years, American businessman Russ George has nurtured a controversial idea, fix global warming by seeding the ocean with iron. We have a, a corporate mantra, and that is save the world, make a little money on the side. Wow. Yeah. The, the drama of that clip. <laughs> I know for for a man who admittedly is like looks like someone's dad. Yeah, if he's ever worn anything besides cargo shorts, no one's ever caught him <laughs> exactly. in like slacks. That's a Hawaiian shirt, cargo short till he dies, guy. <laughs> also, he starts the clip with "All you have to do is buy Mother Nature a drink, a, a cheap, cheap drink, drink yeah. every month, and take care of her." Like, ugh. Yeah, what a what a like old school kind of like macho man. Women, they would just won't shut up, will they? <laughs> They get free drinks everywhere. Buy her a new dress and <laughs> let her yap to her friends and she'll be a wife forever. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck, man? Um, so that's Russ George. He is uh, an American businessman. 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 He's a businessman. He's a businessman. Nicole, with, he's a businessman. With a controversial plan. Uh-oh. Um, and ha, da, da, da. <laughs> Sorry. I thought you wanted me to do the <laughs> To do the background yeah. music. I think it, I think it helps. Um, the, the, we'll get into like more of the science in a second, but basically he wants to put iron in the ocean in an effort to help suck carbon out of the atmosphere. So whereas solar geoengineering reflected the sun's light and heat away from the earth, um, this kind of geoengineering would suck carbon out of the atmosphere. And just in case our listeners either didn't listen to the solar geoengineering episode or did and then immediately got clocked in the dome by a bowling ball, <laughs> um, what is geoengineering? Well, I mean, first of all, go listen to the episode because as I say, or in the go first to the episode, hospital. Yeah, for your yeah, bowling please ball go to the injury. hospital. And then while you're there, it's going to be a long wait. You may as well re listen to the episode. So, definitions of exactly what geoengineering is kind of vary, but basically, it's a way of dealing with climate change once the carbon is already in the atmosphere. So rather than trying to get us to emit less, the goal of geoengineering is to be like, look, the carbon's already up there. Global warming is happening. How can we alter either the amount of uh, radiation that we're receiving from the sun or suck some of the carbon out so that we don't have to deal with such extreme consequences of climate change. Gotcha. Gotcha. Is it is it gauche to say it's the liposuction option rather than the healthier lifestyle option? I don't think it's gauche to say that. Okay. I'm still not saying it. Okay, but if you I'm did, not on the record saying it. It wouldn't it. be gauche. Okay, that's good. Great. Also, um, what is gauche exactly? Gauche means left in French. Ugh, political. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is not a politics podcast. Not at all. Uh, well, I mean. How dare you? <laughs> You're telling me this is a politics podcast? I'm out of here. Sorry, surprise. Um, so whereas 
Solar geoengineering seeks to reflect heat away from the planet before it can get trapped in the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, this version of geoengineering seeks to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. So once the heat gets here, it, it won't get trapped. Okay. Yeah. And so there's other versions of this, like direct air carbon capture yes. is sort of like this form of geoengineering. Yes. Okay. Um, and that tends to be the one that the fossil fuel companies are more directly invested in. Um, as we discussed in the first episode about geoengineering, they don't seem to really be funding these other schemes very much, but mm. that doesn't mean that other people aren't interested in them. Uh, and specifically trying to save the world, but making a little money on the side <laughs> per Russ George. Um, and we're talking about this for two reasons. One is that this form of like climate delay of um, discussing geoengineering in this way doesn't come up quite as much as solar geoengineering but mm -hmm. once a month once every few months an article pops up about it so there was one in october 2023 called to slow climate change some want to quote engineer the ocean uh there was another one in the new york times in september 2023 iron dust could reverse the course of climate change in april 2023 scientists want to dump iron nanoparticles in the ocean to save the planet in february 2023 mit technical review these startups hope to spray iron particles above the ocean to fight climate change so it's mm. it, you're seeing it fairly consistently even if uh, not quite as loudly or as much as solar geoengineering. Gotcha. So it sounds like there's kind of a lot of articles about it. Yeah, but they're all super hypothetical. It's not like super well studied. Even the titles of the articles are all things like some want to engineer the ocean or iron dust could reverse the course of climate change. These startups hope to spray iron particles. So it's like... Uh, sort of wouldn't it be cool if this worked mm. rather than like providing an actual tangible solution that we could do right now. Gotcha. So before we get to what his whole story is, and it's fun, stick around. <laughs> um, but before we get to what his whole story is, like let's talk a little bit about like what is the science of ocean fertilization? Does okay. it work? Um, and also because the term ocean fertilization is kind of gross. A little gross. It's a little gross. Ocean fertilization is increasingly rebranded so sometimes you'll hear it called ocean seeding sometimes you'll hear it called ocean nourishment ocean jizzing yeah ocean, yeah. <laughs> yeah ocean jizzing sometimes not many people call it that moistening of the wet ocean yeah okay upsetting uh russ george calls it ocean restoration which makes it sound good okay um there's also some people call it marine snow <laughs> that's what i call cocaine yeah that's what i was gonna say is it feels like cocaine you do on a yacht right, right? Yeah, uh, so I wouldn't call it that. Um, let's just stick with ocean jizz, shall we? Uh, ocean jizz. Basically, what's happening when you're dumping these iron particles into the ocean is you improve the growth conditions for organisms like phytoplankton and algae. Oh. Um, and phytoplankton and algae eat CO2 because they're... Because they love it. They love it. They're, they're mostly plants, but there's like also zooplankton who are like animals, but then they also photosynthesize. So it's like a little bit complicated, but basically they're like plants. They eat CO2. And then as they grow, they suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And when they die or get eaten by marine life, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and they carry that carbon down with them, sequestering it. Cool. So that's the basic idea. And, and sorry, what about the iron helps the plankton grow? So iron is a critical element for the growth of ocean creatures, but it's like highly dispersed in the ocean. So it's, it's one of the elements that's like in the least supply. So in the presence of more iron, more plankton can grow. So Raleigh, I'm going to play, it's going to be the same video we just watched. And can you just describe for our viewers what it looks like? Sure. And for the record, Nicole, I could watch this video a hundred times. Like, <laughs> there's new gold to be mined in every view. Yeah. I mean, it's a 47 minute piece, so we could watch the whole thing. Hey, we're editing a 47 minute Climate Town video right now. Wow. Well, I hope it's as good and as dramatic as this video about Russ George's. Uh, so here he is in his lab and then we're going to see him on a boat okay. in a second. So just describe kind of what the iron looks like. Sure. So he is in his lab. He's pouring sort of red powder out of what looks like an old peanut butter jar into a trough. Yeah. And the red powder is the oxidized iron. Uh, and now he's like using a hose to spray what looks like red iron and water mixed up and they're dumping it into the ocean. Yeah. It, it is basically like it looks like he almost has like a slurry. Yeah, like a slurry. You know when you get like a uh, dry paint that you have to mix with like oil or water, it just comes in that powder. It I looks like I don't know the last time I had to fuck with paint. So no. I think I think I just have very strong memories of like elementary school art class. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't remember using powder, but I'll take your word for it. Okay. I, I look, I mean, I was I'm famously 2 years younger than you, so <laughs> maybe we got that technology after you left. Don't remind me. <laughs> So uh, when we talk about dumping iron into the ocean, we literally mean it's powdered iron that we're dumping into the ocean. Yeah, it's not like pieces of rebar that you're 
pounding yeah. in a concrete, but it's like flaky yeah, little it's like putting particulates. putting cinnamon in your coffee. Okay. Or putting iron in my coffee. Yes, which you do. I love it. Yeah. It makes my teeth nice and strong and red. <laughs> <laughs> clang, clang, clang. Um, iron is required for the synthesis of chlorophyll and um, several photosynthetic electron transport proteins. Oh, yeah, of course. Photosynthetic electron transport proteins. Which you know all about. Of course. Because you studied something real in college. Yeah, also famously. I'm two years older than you. That is, yes, that is famously the main thing about us. Um, And in addition to being required for the photosynthetic electron transport proteins, uh, it's also required for the reduction of CO2, SO4 2 minus, and NO3 minus. It is required for the reduction of them during the photosynthetic production of organic compounds. Reduction here means that it's gaining electrons. Right. Oil rig, baby. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain. Oil rig. Wow. Yeah. Do you think the oil companies came up with that? For sure, dude. It goes all <laughs> the way to the top. Let's get Arrhenius in here. Um, so basically, iron is an essential component of the chemical reaction that makes photosynthesis work. And um, because it's in limited supply in the ocean, part of what limits the growth of algae and phytoplankton is when they run out of iron, they just can't photosynthesize anymore. So by putting a bunch more iron in, they can photosynthesize more and grow more. And they'll proliferate. So mm-hmm. case closed. Let's dump some iron particles into the ocean and get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Nicole, what are we still doing here? <laughs> Well, this actually happens in nature in a variety of ways. Um, So when there's a big storm on land that increases nutrient runoff, this can happen either from farmland or particularly iron-rich sources of land. When the ocean's currents move around, Mm. um, it can bring up some iron. Exactly, exactly. And this one was interesting to me. When whales dive down to the deep sea and then come up, they bring a bunch of nutrients up with them. Interesting. Yeah. And so that's why like when you hear about like whales being essential for like ecological balance in a lot of ways, that's mm. a big part of it is they bring a bunch of like nutrient rich uh, water up from the bottom of the ocean. Gotcha. Um, so this is a mechanical process that we can observe in the ocean. So the science of it is uh, at least somewhat sound. And this would be great if it were that simple. Uh, but unfortunately, the ocean is a lot more complex than that. And, and so is plankton. Mm. So I'm having trouble getting a sense of how serious this is as a climate solution. Are there governments looking into this? Are there NGOs that are trying to do this? What's going on? Uh, NGOs, maybe governments, no. In fact, one of the problems with it is governments are going to have to kind of get on the same page about when and where you're allowed to dump stuff in the ocean. Um, and like with solar geoengineering, you know, who gets harmed because of that. And so it's actually like a more complicated diplomatic issue. Um, But the only people who are doing this, as far as I know, are basically just like random people who are trying this. But it doesn't seem to be like there's a huge organizational push for it on any level. People who are sometimes referred to as quacks. (laughs) Your words, not mine. Got it. Ducks ducks words, really. (laughs) Okay, when did this idea first originate? So this idea was first put forward by this guy, John Martin. And John Martin was an oceanographer and the head of the Moss Landing Marine Laboratory in California. Awesome. And he received a shipment of iron filings on accident. Was like, <laughs> what the fuck do I do with these? Um, he has this famous quote uh, where he said, give me half a tanker of iron and I will give you an ice age. Wow. Which sounds like a threat. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's very like you give me half a tanker of Bond villain and I'll give you a dead James Bond. <laughs> Wait, so you give me a barrel of iron you and give I'll give me you an half ice a age. tanker of iron and I will give you an ice age. And he is referring to this process of uh, increasing plant life in the ocean to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere oh. and cool things down. He started researching this explicitly like in terms of climate change and CO2 removal. So oh, I, maybe I I don't know why I thought he was like an 1800s era scientist. When is this guy relevant? The 1980s. Oh, okay. So he's very recent. Yeah, very okay. recent. John Martin. Sorry, buddy. I just thought you were... He's dead. He's not going to hear this. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many nice things to say about him. So Martin started doing a few experiments in this area. He died while putting together the Iron X-1 experiment, <laughs> uh, which sounds very jet. cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, The Iron X-1 experiment um, dumped iron around the Galapagos Islands, and then there was a big bloom of phytoplankton. The aim of this experiment was really just to show that iron is indeed a limiting factor for plankton, and if you add more, it will allow more plankton and algae to bloom in the ocean. It wasn't really to, like, meaningfully take any carbon out of the atmosphere. It was just like, look, the theory works. 
and he had enough know-how to say like okay if we have more algae they're going to suck more co2 out and that's going to lead that, yes, to yes that that is what the theory was um so iron x2 repeated the experiment and it also solved why the first experiment's results weren't as dramatic as he'd hoped i looked for a long time to figure out what the answer to that was and that sentence is as much as i could figure out about iron x2 Wow. Also, like, really metal names. Like, punk oh, yeah. Rock Iron X1 ass. and Iron X2. Yeah, this is like some Iron Man shit for real. Yeah, it rules. Um, since then, about 10 other experiments have been conducted by various groups, some more legit than others. And um, they have really contradictory results. So, there's some experiments that show that ocean fertilization works and it's relatively harmless. There's some experiments that show that, like, it kind of works, but it doesn't really sequester carbon. And then there's other experiments that show that it doesn't work and it has harmful consequences for the ocean. Wow. So, as of right now, there's not like a ton of consensus on on whether or not this is a good idea in any capacity. Wow. Okay. So, so it, it's strange that they got such different results, but I guess that's just like, that's how like plankton might live in different places or something like that? That's a great question. And it actually leads us nicely into the debunk because a, a big reason for that is it's just really hard to design a good experiment around this. Mm. Um, it's tough to find like a perfect control group. You can't know exactly where the iron is going to go. It's hard to find the right peanut butter jar to put the iron filings exactly. in. Exactly. Have you ever tried to wash a peanut butter jar? It's hard to get it it's all out tough. of there. Usually I just give it to my dog and she'll just like lick it pretty clean. Yeah, but then she's all full of iron and <laughs> you gotta take her to the vet. It's a whole thing. And it's really easy to dump the iron in a way that is harmful. So for example, you can seed the wrong things. Um, ocean fertilization can produce helpful phytoplankton blooms, but it can also produce bad ones. Mm. Um, I mentioned before that there's a difference between phytoplankton and zooplankton, and the distinction is like kind of messy. And so, like, things are either plants or animals, Nicole. Yeah. Which one is it? <laughs> Um, but like, for example, some types of plankton can photosynthesize, but then also respirate. Is that right? They can, um, they can exhale CO2. They oh, can okay. feed off of li living organisms and exhale CO2. Um, so, you know, it's potentially putting some of that CO2 back into the atmosphere. Also, uh, this is a quote from your alma mater, Columbia, hey. their climate change page. Um, harmful algae blooms cost the U.S. millions of dollars in damages each year due to fishery and tourism losses, damage to drinking water, cleanup costs, and hospital visits. Mm. So there's like some kinds of stuff in the ocean that you don't want to seed um and in salt water the biggest example of that is called a red tide oh yeah yes oh no <laughs> yes yeah, so they're not good um and i'm gonna read directly from my outline for this because i don't want to get the science wrong sure. <laughs> um dinoflagellates and diatoms cause the most harmful algal blooms in salt water Red tide toxins can make both humans and animals sick. The dinoflagellate species Karenia brevis produces a neurotoxin that can cause paralysis and respiratory failure and disrupt reproduction in marine life. In humans, it causes eye and respiratory irritation and, if consumed in tainted seafood, numbness, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. This spring, red tides in Florida killed thousands of fish and other marine animals, including increasingly threatened manatees. Oh, no. We love manatees. <sighs> um, red tides have increased 15-fold in Florida over the last 50 years. That's oh, also from uh, Colombia. Yeah. So it's not good. And those are the kind of things that you can accidentally seed if you're trying to like do ocean fertilization. Because when you throw iron in there, you can't just give it to the right kind of yeah. phytoplankton. Yeah. I just want to note about the dinoflagellate, the Karenia brevis, that it produces a neurotoxin that causes paralysis and respiratory failure and disrupts reproduction in marine life, where it's like, it'll paralyze your whole body or stop you from breathing. And you can't really get it up. You know, like, <laughs> eh, it it kind of kills the mood being so dead. <laughs> it's like it's very clear why that one is the third in the list. Yeah, yeah. It's like the one of them's a bummer and the other two you'll die. Yeah. Um yeah, so you can't really control which organisms are getting this iron and which are proliferating because of it. And it can also result in what are called dead zones in the ocean. So in addition to iron, Oxygen is also in limited supply in the ocean. And when you create more life, there's more organisms to suck up all of the oxygen. Mm. Also, when these big uh, algae or phytoplankton blooms die and decay, the decomposition process also uses up oxygen. Mm. So 
if you do too much of this, then there's no longer enough oxygen in these patches of the ocean for like any like fish or other species to live. Um, and according to a 2020 report, the dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River results in $2.4 billion each year in damages to fisheries and marine habitat. Holy shit. Yeah, it's a big problem. And um, decomposition can also release methane, which is, Hell yeah. a, which is a much worse greenhouse gas than CO2. In the short term. In the short term. But yes. Uh, but it's we we're living in the short term. Hey, I'm I'm living uh, living in the short term. <laughs> I live my life like Vin Diesel from the first Fast <laughs> and the Furious movie, one mile at a time. Yeah. Um. So so you really don't quarter mile at a time. Quarter mile at a time. That is a short race. I feel like I could run a quarter mile pretty fast. Do you think you could do it faster than the car? It depends on who's driving the car. What kind of car it is? Uh-huh. It's a lot of factors. Okay, it it's Vin Diesel's character from The Fast and the Furious, Dom Moretta. Yes, it's Dom Moretta, but he's driving one of those uh, little play school Flintstones cars that you got to run with your feet. I could smoke that guy's turkey. Okay, for sure. Okay, well, depending. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of feet? Horse feet. Oh yeah, hooves. Yes. <laughs> Uh, moving on. Where were we, Nicole? <laughs> Who the fuck knows? Uh, here, there I am in a foot race against Dom from <laughs> Blast and the Furious in a Flintstones child's car. And that's the end of the preview. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear the whole episode, head on over to our Patreon page where we got the whole thing ad free. Now, do not worry. We got a bunch of episodes right here for free. But if you want to support the show and hear us cracking wise about other people's mamas, the Patreon page is the place to do it. I hope to see you there, but obviously, you know, you do you. Bye.